Hi everyone, welcome back. This is our third installment of our uh, Meals for the Stomach Cancer Patient series. Uh, we are very grateful to our sponsors as well as the Debbie's Dream Foundation for, uh, as always, helping us set this up. And of course, Gordon Ramsay Steak for hosting us uh, here in Baltimore. Uh, so today, uh, of course, I have with me Ms. Mary Eve, our nutritionist. How are you doing today? I'm good, Zach. How are you? Uh, very good, thanks. Uh, today we're going to be making some recipes that are a little ahead of time. These are some fall recipes. It is still pretty hot outside, but uh, we're going to sort of go over these so you have something in mind once that season comes around, which is actually coming up here pretty soon. Uh, as far as what we're doing today, we'll have our butternut squash soup, which we're going to get started in just a moment. Uh, and then kind of a, a Thanksgiving feel for what's going on. So we'll have a, a turkey loaf. We'll also have a uh, parsnip puree, uh, very similar to a mashed potato feel, and uh, some spiced carrots as well. And we'll have a pumpkin pie parfait for dessert. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to get the things that take, as usual, the things that take longest to do, we're going to start with first. And that'll just help, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of your time management as well. So we're going to start off with the soup. So it is very hot, although today in Baltimore it's actually pretty rainy. Yeah, I went through a bunch of rain. Um, and so I'm here today, if you have any nutrition questions, oh, yes, excuse me. Yeah. please uh, type them in and we can talk about them um, as, as we go along. Absolutely. So we're just going to start off by sweating some onions for our soup. And that's often what you'll start with in any recipe, is sweating the onions. It really brings out the flavor and the aromatic value of the onions. And as I've mentioned in the series before, I, I love onions. That's I'll put them in everything. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have some carrots as well. Again, we're just sweating these. So for now, we have them just in a little bit of oil, a neutral oil like uh, canola or vegetable oil is just fine. And cooking the vegetables is much easier to digest than raw. Exactly. So anywhere along the journey that you're in, um, whether you're in treatment, after surgery, post-op, cook vegetables and onions and carrots easy to digest. Definitely, and so as we cook those down, we'll let them just sit for a minute. We're not gonna cook them for very long. You don't want them to start caramelizing. You just want them to cook out a little bit of the water content and gain a little of that aromatic flavor. Uh, once that sweats for a little bit uh, and becomes a little more translucent, we'll add the butternut squash. For now, we can go ahead and actually jump right on to our uh, Oh, excuse me. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. All right. So uh, actually, we're going to jump to the uh, parsnip mash. So here, what we're doing is incredibly simple, uh, which I really uh, always take pride in having just simple recipes. Uh, I think it helps you get to the eating part faster. <laughs> so that's uh, always ideal. Uh, here, we're just going to have some parsnip, which I've cut up. If you don't know what a parsnip looks like, uh, here we have a, a whole parsnip, uh, not, not peeled or anything. Uh, you'll see it looks kind of like a carrot, obviously a different color, um, and it is, a, uh, in terms of flavor, about a cross between a carrot and a potato. It has a nice starchiness to it, uh, and in that sense, uh, it, will it will be very filling, but it might not be sort of, uh, as, whereas potatoes might not be recommended, this is a little he healthier of an option. Yeah, all the root, so, you know, we're trying to eat in season. That's really important for our health, because when we're eating in season, we're eating closer to us, uh, more nourishing foods. The parsnip, so root vegetables skinned are really easy to digest, the so sweet potatoes, white potatoes, parsnips, carrots. Um, I find parsnips a little bit sweeter than a carrot, Yes. Um, but they sit really well. They're really easy, easy, easy to digest. Um, and so Zach is adding cream, and one of the things we talked about is that sometimes people after gastrectomy, or sometimes even during treatment, dairy doesn't sit well. You can have dumping with it or um, gas or bloating. So Zach and I were kind of talking before we, we came on about what it would be other alternatives to um, dairy cream. And I had suggested coconut milk. Yes, coconut milk would be a great option. It or has coconut this, cream. Or a coconut cream. That viscosity is what you're going for. Uh, if you use milk, that you run the risk of it not having that same creaminess level because there's not as much milk fat in milk as there is in cream. Um, that being said, if you cooked it for a little longer, you would cook a little of the water content out. And as such, you would achieve similar results. But I would actually, if you wanted to substitute cream, I actually would go for something like coconut milk before I went for something uh, like regular milk because that'll achieve that same viscosity. You want a nice, hearty sort of thing going on. I 
think the last resort would probably be some type of veggie stock or something. Correct, yes. When in doubt, but you, you really want that creamy level. If you needed to, after the fact, what you could do is add something in to give it that creaminess, uh, either a vegan sour cream, something like that. Mm -hmm. You can always sort of, what I love about cooking is you can always fix things as you go. So if things aren't quite right, just tweak it a little and it'll be all right. Did you talk about using the potato flakes in that? I did. I'll, I'll get to that uh, in a moment. Yeah. So, I'm jumping uh, ahead. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with uh, anything in terms of milk or cream, any dairy, uh, when you're bringing it to a boil, be very careful. You, uh, it will start to scald, is the term. Uh, eventually, it'll really uh, knock off the flavor. It's not going to work well. And also, just <laughs> uh, in terms of safety, it will come to the lid very quickly. Mm. So once it hits that boil, you're going to want to kill the heat to a nice low and let it just sit and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, sort of cook itself out 30 minutes or so, and you should be fine. You still want the parsnip to have a little bit of substance to it. Uh, right now, obviously, there's still plenty raw, but they'll start to look Honestly, like cooked potatoes. They'll mm -hmm. look about the same way. Mm -hmm. They're also really good roasted. Oh, yeah. Roasted, fried. You can actually substitute parsnip in lieu of potatoes as french fries and julienne them. Uh, yeah, they, they, yeah, and their sweetness carries over really well. They just, it just works with a lot of different sauces. So these are almost ready. This will take a minute. Now that that's sauteed down, though, we can go ahead and add the butternut squash. So Zach, you did really smart with the squash because the squashes aren't there yet for the season. Correct. So because we're doing this in advanced, uh, the challenge is that some of the stuff may be at market, but it might be a little underripe. It might be not quite the texture you're looking for. So in this case, I actually opted for frozen butternut squash. By the time that you're trying these recipes out in the next month or two, it will start to be available and it'll be a lot better texture, a lot better quality. And what I tell people to do is when you're buying a butternut squash, try to buy one that has a long neck on it yep. and a small bulb. Sometimes yep. people buy the big bulbs and it's like... Because it's appealing, right? You, you think, <laughs> oh, there's more substance to it. But actually that indicates that it's not quite what you're looking for in terms of taste and texture. And I also tell people to microwave it a little bit just to get a little mm. bit soft. Then you can peel it easier. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. Because it's peeling it can be... A but, pain in the, in the, in it, the it, butternut it, neck. In the neck. Um, <laughs> So what I liked with this is that if I have, you know, if I have limited energy or I have limited dexterity and I can't peel things really good, yes. the frozen chopped, awesome. Yes, it's definitely. easy, easy, There's easy. no shame in convenience uh, and these ingredients are essentially just the ingredients in the bag. There are no preservatives in most of these products. So you're really getting an equivalent yep. product yeah. most of the time. Yeah. If you take pride in terms of sourcing your ingredients, uh, a farmer's market, for yep. example, no shame in that either. Uh, but they're, they're really, either way, you're, you're going to have some quality food. Uh, so don't worry about necessarily where the source is coming from. Yeah. So we're going to let this keep cooking for a moment. And then we'll go ahead and add the uh, veggie stock. So you can see already we're getting some bubbles. I, I will keep my eye on, uh, on this. But it will take a little time to come up to heat. All right. So we're making our way. We're going to go ahead and mix our uh, turkey loaf now. Let me grab my bowl here. And ground meats are so much easier to digest than solid meats. So Definitely. Um, if you're in treatment or newly out of surgery, uh, a ground meat can just sit so much better. And when you're doing these small, frequent meals, you really want to eat your protein first because your protein is really important. And Zach, did you use turkey breast or did you just So this is ground turkey breast. Um, I, I've just known that it's always better to opt for that. I think at times it can be a little more expensive. Uh, just to be aware of that, but um, generally it's the most commonly available uh, ground turkey is, yeah. is going to be the breast. When you do just ground turkey, you're getting the dark meat more so than the, than the breast. So it's a little bit heavier to digest. The dark okay. meat is higher in fat. That. Yeah. So uh, obviously I'm wearing gloves right now just to keep the mess at bay. Uh, working at home, uh, please make sure to wash your hands before working with any ground product. The reason primarily being uh, with any ground meat, what's going on is there's more surface area for bacteria to grow as opposed to just a normal steak. Once you grind that up into ground beef, it's going to just have more opportunity for bacteria to grow, for uh, yourself to get sick, anything like that. So gloves, ideally, if you don't have gloves at the very least, definitely wash your hands thoroughly. So with this, very simply, we're just going to mix in. Oh, excuse me. Actually, before we do that, we are actually going to saute these two off to, again, aromatize that, but I will mix in the ingredients that we uh, don't need to affect. So we have some uh, stuffing mix here that uh, 
just bought from the store, nothing fancy. I did opt for the turkey stuffing mix as opposed to the chicken stu uh, stuffing mix, and that is something that when you play around at home in terms of your plating, in terms of your flavoring, um, building those layers is really important and will help you, I think, understand your food a little better. Uh, you might use chicken stock when you're ch cooking chicken. You might use, you know, yep. uh, mushroom yep. stock when you want a, a mushroom gravy. Yep. And starting that way is going to help you develop a lot deeper flavor, a lot more yep. intense flavor. You could also use a cornbread stuffing if you wanted to. There you go. And the great thing about using the stuffing mix, it takes out the seasoning that you have to add. I mean, we're going to add other seasoning, but yeah. it's already seasoned. So and now that's actually, it's uh, funny you bring that up. That is also something that... Um, that I wanted to talk about in terms of the seasoning of this. Now, we're gonna add a mixture of uh, ketchup and cranberry sauce. And while you could season the mix directly, and here we just have a, a little bit of it so far, I'll go ahead and mix it up. Uh, while you could season it directly, I actually, in terms of building flavor, like to do things like season this mix, which we'll make in a second. Oh. That way, once it mixes in, it's more thoroughly oh, mixed in. I love that, in. that's a great idea. So just little stuff like that. Uh, we so have I have here. a question. Uncle. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> what can I substitute for the squash? Hmm. I might defer to you. I mean, in yeah. terms of, I mean, it's butternut squash soup, so that's, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so there are many different types of squashes. So there's acorn squash, there's delicata, right. Right. there, you know, spaghetti squash. Spaghetti squash. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't tried squash, I actually think starting with a butternut is actually a good place to start hmm. because it's a lot more mild. It's mild, mm -hmm. it's really delicious. And the other thing I think, I think people sometimes don't eat a lot of variety of vegetables because they weren't maybe cooked properly when they yes. were growing up. Very much so. they so. have like a negative, like. They're, right, they have a negative experience. It was overly cooked and it wasn't really cooked right. But yeah. um, I, try something new and this is really easy and little effort needs to be put into this. If you don't want to make it yourself, you can also, you know, you could buy a butternut squash soup just to try it to see if it's something that you would like. Um, pumpkin would be the other thing that I would think would oh, go yeah. into this. In fact, uh, if you wanted to add even more uh, sort of, of an orange color to, yep. or a little more substance without adding too much extra flavor, pumpkin would be a good pumpkin option. Pumpkin is awesome. Yeah, I, 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 I like all those Yeah, you could, buy, you could buy canned pumpkin, but again, like if you buy a pumpkin at the grocery store, there are different, actually different varieties of different pumpkins. And again, you're gonna wanna buy one with a long neck and a small uh, head um, to get the majority of the pumpkin. Uh, of the actual substance, uh, yeah, the, the, the substance. meat, if you will. But you could also buy just canned pumpkin and, and, and do it with that. And we actually will be uh, using canned pumpkin in uh, one of our recipes, the dessert today, uh, but we will get to that. So we have a pan here. Uh, very simply, we're just going to combine the ketchup and the cranberry sauce. And you'll get, you know, obviously a great zest from that. Um, Sometimes you may think uh, both of these are on the acidic side of flavor, so they might not work. You only ever need one acid in a food. It's only lemon juice or that sort of thing. But actually, they can play together, uh, much the same way as uh, paint, different paint colors on a palette might play together, even if they seem similar or seem to be working in the same way. Um, it's, all, it's all about using these flavors to build with each other and, uh, at the end of the day, just have something beautiful on the plate. Well, I think the cranberry is sweet. I think if the ketchup is acid, so... See, that's funny. I think of them both as on the acidic side. Do you? Well, I think of when I think of cranberries, I think of when I was a child and I they're, tried they're raw tart. cranberries. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, these aren't like the ones I had, uh, you know, in my snack pack. But um, so we're just going to mix these together very simply and add a little bit of spice. Uh, what we're adding here is people may be familiar with as warming spices, pumpkin spice mix. Uh, there's a lot of different names for it. Essentially, these are spices that are popular in the fall and winter. Yeah. That's, that's the gist of it. Um, and the reason being is because, as one of the names suggests, they produce a warming characteristic when you ingest them. They, they sort of warm you from the inside, as it were. Um, and, they, and we'll be using several different ones. Um, the sort of traditional pumpkin spice blend is going to often be clove, allspice, uh, sometimes a little bit of uh, ginger, and then we have some nutmeg, that sort of thing. Here we'll have a few uh, others as well. We have cumin, we have cardamom. Uh, me personally, I like, um, I like everything on the, closer to the savory side than the sweeter side. Uh, so I, this will help balance it for me. However, if you wanted to omit the cumin and instead uh, substitute allspice, that sort of thing, you'll get that more familiar pumpkin spice taste, that sort of uh, pumpkin spice latte, that, that undercurrent of spice that you're looking for. Uh, and it will be on the sweeter side, so, so you'll benefit there. And 
all of these are huge antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, so, so spices are your friend. Spices are definitely spices your are friend, your friend. any way you cut it. All right, so we have here just a little garlic, just a little bit. We're gonna do nutmeg, we're gonna do a little cumin, or cumin, as my father says. I always wondered which was correct. I think they're both correct. I say cumin. Oh, see, there you go. What do you say? I switch. Okay. <laughs> I, I use them interchangeably. So I'm gonna go a little heavy on the clove. Keep in mind that clove is a very powerful spice and you really don't need that much. Right. So I did two pinches instead of one. Again, not going crazy over here, but, and so it, by spicing the ketchup, or excuse me, the ketchup cranberry mix, when we then mix it into the loaf, it's gonna thoroughly imbue into All right, it. I have a spice question. Yeah. Are there any spices that stomach cancer patients should stay away from and which are best? I'll defer to you on that one. That's okay. a great question. So <clears throat> sometimes right after surgery, doing things that have a high sp spicy content to them, so like just a high amount of spices, like a chipotle mm -hmm. or a jalapeno or something along that line, I do not recommend. Okay. In the very beginning, I tend to tell people to go bland. I wouldn't do pepper. I wouldn't do any of those you know, kind of really spicy spices. Now, is it the capsaicin <clears throat> in there that's irritating or it, what exactly is? So your anatomy is new. It's trying mm -hmm. to get used to itself. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have much of a pocket. Right. And so if you put something spicy in there, it can also then kind of move things through too quickly. Understood. So bland is going to be best. But then eventually you should be able to incorporate all foods. And That's what, the goal. And what's nice about spices is they're all, as much as we often combine things into spice mixes, it's, what's fun about it is if you can try one spice at a time and really learn what that spice uh, experience is, you can even sometimes just use one or two spices in a blend and really notice the difference as opposed to the, the spice blend that you might buy at the store. Right, that sort of right. Thing. And you could adjust this. So, exactly. if, so if I'm somebody, I just can't do a lot of that, it could just be the cranberry maybe, maybe and the Maybe the store the ketchup. one's a little too spicy for you in that case. Just bring your own spices. Yeah, yeah. It'll be good. So I think there's a lot of play with that. So in this case, we are about set with the sauce here. Uh, really just mixing until it is mixed. Yep. And, that, and that's about it. We'll let it cool off a little bit. We're going to hit this pan now, and we're going to saute off the carrot, or excuse me, it's carrot, the uh, onion and celery that are going in our uh, turkey loaf. So again, oh, you always want to be sauteing these because it unlocks a certain flavor that isn't there when it's raw. Uh, uh, chefs will call it the aromatic quality of it. Uh, and really, that is because it, it hits the air. It hits your nostrils. It, it's an aroma that, that plays with your palate before you even taste the food. And, and for so, our people, easier to digest. Yes. And I, when I they're would cooked. imagine it would whet your appetite a little, too. Mm. Uh, you know, sometimes you may not feel like eating. These are the sorts of, at least to me, familiar and comfortable flavors. Uh, and aromas that, that sort of, you know, bring you, bring you in. Yeah, I mean, you just have to watch that if, if somebody is in chemotherapy, smells can be, we talked about this. Yes. Woo! And, you know, and, and if I'm feeling queasy, I don't want to smell a bunch of things. Exactly, that some things I find uh, delicious are maybe a little bit uh, triggering, that sort of thing. So definitely listen to your body more than anything else. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as spices go, I would recommend trying things one at a time. Uh, for example, a lot of times you'll see a curry mix at the store. Curry, by definition, is a mixture. Um, there is no one curry mix, and so you might want to make your own curry mix that's significantly less spicy, less intense uh, yep. than, than the store-bought one. And you may have really good fortune there because you'll still get to enjoy what everyone else is enjoying in terms of curry mix, but it won't be as intense on your body. Yeah, I do the same thing with like any kind of Mexican mix. I always make mm -hmm. my own. I don't buy the prepackaged ones. Right, those, those can be very spicy. And they have a lot of salt in them, so I... And definitely a lot I of mean, salt. Yeah. That's an excellent yeah. point. So again, we're just gonna sweat the onions and we have some celery this time. You'll find in a lot of recipes, um, a term called mirepoix. Mirepoix is just the simple combination of carrot, celery, and onions. Uh, those three together are the aromatic vegetables that start off most dishes. It's how you make stock, it's how you make most soups. Um, even, um, uh, let's say, ground beef uh, that you might be cooking for a lasagna, you'll throw some onions and celery in there to give it some flavor before you put it mm -hmm. in the layers of, lasagna, uh, of pasta. I have a question about what ground meat is the best for stomach cancer patients? Um, That's a great question. Yeah, any lean, any lean ground meat. So we talked about turkey breast, it could be ground chicken. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. If you are going to do a ground beef, I tell people to try to do like a 90% 
um, uh, lean meat to, lean to, meat fat, ratio. And to fat ratio. I, I know you guys like 80-20 in the chef world. Yes, that is the, <laughs> the, the perfect mixture, but no, that's a great point. And you'll be able to find at the store several options in terms of uh, ground beef. And you'll, if you look on the package, it'll tell you the ratio. It's typically 80-20. There's also a 73 to oh. 26. Okay. I, I find that a little mm. too, yeah, too yeah. fatty. Um, but uh, so there's different numbers, so be sure to pay attention. Uh, and that'll help you in terms of, uh, as Mary's saying, in terms of um, that lean meat ratio. Uh, the higher percentage is always the amount of lean meat. The lower percentage is always the amount of fat that they incorporate. So the yeah. less fat in this case, the better. So above 90%. And then if you can buy grass fed, there is a difference between grass fed beef and um, other forms of feed. So the grass fed do, when they analyze it, it has more omega-3s in it. Really? And yeah, omega-3s, yeah, it is. Omega-3s yeah. are, um, anti-inflammatory, you know, so if you can buy, if, you're, if your food dollar allows to buy the grass-fed, 90% is really a good idea. Yeah, that's great to know. Now, of course, as, as you just indicated, the challenge is uh, sometimes these things will be above our price range. Yep. Um, go with not only what's good for your body, but also what's good for your budget. Yep, um, there's no sense in killing your wallet to have something once, um, then again. Sometimes it's worth saving up, but yeah, in general, on a daily basis, it's better to have a knack for cheap, or I should say affordable, yep. and also available ingredients. Uh, like we mentioned with the butternut squash, it's not quite ready, that sort of thing. You always want to be aware of what's at market, what's affordable, what's in your neighborhood, what's popular too, because if things are popular, it also might be hard to find. Mm. Uh, and so you want to be aware of, maybe I should buy, not necessarily in bulk, but maybe I should buy one extra package and learn to either cook that for later, preserve it. There's a lot of different options, although I know preservation can sometimes run the risk. There's, we, we're using now vinegar, and so that might run into some trouble. Yeah, I, for, I like freezing. Freezing too, exactly. I like, yep. yeah, I like freezing. Even just simply freezing and saving for later can save you some money, um, and can also sort of help you in terms of thinking. When I, I know when I look in the fridge or the freezer, I have sort of a mental list of what do I have, what can I make? Yeah. And so yeah. I think when you have that available, you're giving yourself that opportunity to, you know, have some fun. Yeah, yeah. So like tomatoes now, right? So you can go ahead and roast tomatoes. So just on a pan, mm -hmm. you know, slice them up, a little bit of olive oil, yeah. roast them, and then you can individually freeze them, throw them in the freezer, and later so on you can make tomato soup with it. Right. You know, you can throw it in a pasta That's sauce. Fantastic, yeah. So again, we didn't uh, have these on for very long. Just sweating them a little bit. And we're going to throw them right in with the rest of this. Uh, ideally, you do actually want to let this mix cool. I'm throwing it right in, but I'm realizing one challenge is uh, if you throw it in hot from the pan, you run the risk of actually cooking the turkey cooking a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> when, you, when you begin. But we're cooking it eventually anyway, so not the end of the world. And the reason I really like this recipe is, um, you know, Thanksgiving is coming. Mm -hmm. And if I'm somebody who's in treatment or I've just had surgery, you know, to sit down to that big Thanksgiving meal is not going to be a plan. Yeah. It's going to be very difficult. Yeah, um, definitely. But something like this, which is really easy to digest, but it literally tastes like Thanksgiving dinner. It, <laughs> it really whereas does. Whereas you might be preparing for a whole day, maybe two, and a lot of people take pride in that. I, I myself take pride in, you know, getting ready for a big yeah. holiday event, uh, especially given this year in terms of people might be apart from each other, just, just Zooming together. This allows you to have that Thanksgiving feel, but not necessarily all the Thanksgiving work. Yep. <laughs> and even on a good day, you could prepare this on a good day. I'm feeling well today. Yeah. I'm going to prepare this, and then I'm going to freeze it. And See, then a couple months later, I can take like we were talking about. That's a, that's yeah, a take it out and have Thanksgiving. Um, and you can even um, portion it out as well. So you could cut, yeah. let's say, half of it for now, freeze the other half, or even just into Slice individual it. slices. I love that idea. And yeah. then that way, you can just break out the slices you want without risking uh, wasting yeah. the rest of yeah, the food. Yeah, I love that idea. Love it. So we put about half of the sauce into the mix, and then we'll coat the uh, the loaf once it's formed. While you're mixing, you want to get it nice and incorporated, but uh, also keep in mind you don't want to overmix. Over -mix. So pretty much just as soon as all the ingredients are incorporated, we'll have that ready for you, and we'll shape it up on the pan. I just thought you could even make meatballs with this. Oh yes, definitely meatballs. Because you know, if I can only eat this much, then I'm, I can do that. And when somebody doesn't want to eat, they don't want to look at a bunch of food. It's intimidating. It's like, it's definitely. I don't want to even start. Um, right, where do I begin? Where do I begin? So if I can look at two little of these meatballs and a little bit of puree, I'm 
I'm happy. I, I can do that. And it's funny, uh, over, over time, restaurants used to have much smaller plates. Over time, they've gotten bigger. And I think that hasn't done, uh, <laughs> done us any the favors. Any <laughs> in general, or in the case of uh, patients that may be watching this, it doesn't do anyone uh, any favors particularly. So I have a funny story about that. So my mother, my parents got married in 1953, and her great aunt gave her China. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother has now passed that China on to me, so I have it. And it has a lot of really happy memories for me because, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Anyways, Absolutely. so mom had brought the china up to me and we were setting the table. And we put the plates on the table and I'm looking, I'm like, it doesn't look right to me. And hmm. she's like, what do you mean it doesn't look right? I'm like, I don't know. I just, because I'm a spatial person, I'm like, sure, there's absolutely. something wrong. There's, <laughs> there's, this doesn't look right. So I took my plates, you know, my china out and I put it on the table. Her china, my, my plate was a charger to her plate. So her plates uh. are... So in the early on, the plates were eight inch plates. That was a normal size. What's it now? What, what's up? Uh, 10 inch is the standard now. Yeah. yeah, and they can even be bigger and than that. For those of you who don't know, a charger plate is- oh, um, sorry. No, no problem. I, I, I knew immediately, sorry. but I, I work in this <laughs> industry. A uh, charger plate is actually much like this plate here. Uh, it's the plate that goes under the plate. Uh, and what you'll have in, in fancier restaurants is uh, essentially, uh, that plate will already be at your place setting, and then every plate thereafter is traded up off. It's a way of keeping the table clean. Yeah. It's a sort of refined sensibility. But yes, that's funny. So you, you basically had the larger plate, and it so demonstrated how, 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 how much we've how changed. How much has changed, yeah. you know, in 50 years, in that our plates are getting bigger. When we eat at a bigger plate, we fill it up more. So I try to tell people right. to think we about to fill up whatever's whatever in front of it us. is, yeah. and so that's also cute to people who don't have much of an appetite and can't eat much. You don't want to give them a big, huge plate. You right. actually want to give them a sandwich plate. Okay, that's yeah. That's, so a sandwich plate, you know, is small, that's very good to know. and then a couple things on that, and they look at it like, okay, that's small. Right. I can that's do that. Manageable. Uh, it's manageable. And that's what we're after. Not uh, manageability. I mean, obviously, appeal, flavor. That's what's important to me. But the reason we work together, especially, is because you know it needs to be manageable. And, and we're going to talk about the dessert, but if it looks pretty, you know, oh, yeah. if it looks pretty. That's half the fun. That, that I, can, <laughs> I can be happy with that. So uh, as you see here, I'm just going to glaze the outside with the rest of that cranberry and uh, ketchup mixture. And again, the spices are evenly distributed, so we don't really have to worry too much about if it'll have enough flavor. It's going to be jam-packed. You want to get that nice and even coat. Uh, there's really no wrong way to do this. <laughs> just kind of glaze it over. And if I it's like a little gloopy, it, that's just fine. I like doing it this way instead of doing it in a loaf pan because in a loaf pan, the fat can't escape. Whereas yeah. if there is any fat in this, it can escape. In fact, if you wanted to go a step further, what you could do is use a, uh, a perforated pan, like a, a, a grate, yep. and then have it sit above the grate yep. so that the, the, exactly, the fat can drip away. Or even a rack. Or yeah, more, exactly. Uh, an oven yeah, rack, anything like rack. A, like a cookie sheet with yep. a, with a rack on top, anything like that. Yeah. All right, so that is looking pretty nice. Actually, it was a little light on sauce. You can you can really just cover this, and there's no issue at all. <laughs> so we're gonna throw this in the oven, uh, right around 375. Um, I believe the instructions we provided say 30 minutes. I would recommend going a little longer. Um, I, I, it can't hurt it. it it's, it's ground beef. Uh, the more you cook it, <laughs> the more safe it is, basically. There's really no wrong way to do that. And we talked about, you know, with immunocompromised people, you really have to have that food safety part of this. Absolutely. And So and 165 that, is that technical temperature. But if it's north but of there. Not just, in terms of the, not just in terms of the temperature, but in terms of the texture. You will be right at that point, but it might still feel a little bit chewy, a little bit not quite cooked. It is cooked. It's totally safe, but just make yourself feel better, make your palate feel better. You can absolutely cook it up to 180 degrees if you're not temping it until it's very firm. Yeah. And there's no issue at all. It's not worrying like, for example, with a nice steak, oh, have I overcooked it? It's impossible to overcook. It's ground beef. You're, you're cooking it completely in the first place. So. And what you said, the surface area, it's more manipulated, so there's more chances there's more of chance. bacteria getting exactly. in. So. The, the longer the better, honestly, especially in terms of uh, those watching us today. So this, uh, theoretically, we would let these continue to simmer, although through TV magic, I have already prepared our soup and our uh, parsnip mash. So we will plate those in just a second. But yeah, you would have this, both of these would cook for about 30 more minutes. Again, the parsnip you want to make sure is um, lost some of its firmness, but not completely mush, so that you have some substance. Um, 
Basically, you'll go ahead and pulverize these. You can use a blender. An immersion blender is my personal favorite. Uh, you don't have to change pans. You can just do it right in the pot. Keeps all the flavor. Uh, but in terms of that, when you pulverize it, you might find it a little thin. And so this is where we oh. get to the potato flakes. So uh, a little recommendation uh, that I would, um, would say is if your uh, parsnip puree is a little thin because, let's say, you added a little too much heavy cream, uh, there's a couple of options. You can cut up and uh, uh, peel and cut up more parsnip and cook it in the very mash until it's ready and then go ahead and pulverize it. Or what I did actually just as a fun little uh, experiment, you can use uh, instant potato flakes as a sort of thickening agent. Hmm. Um, so that actually helped the consistency come out perfectly. It's going to be picture perfect for the plate. If it is a little, thi uh, a little thick, you can always just add some more heavy cream. I would err on the side of thicker so that you can then just thin it out because once it's too thin, it's, yeah. it's harder, harder to bring it back to, to thick. Um, so we have that turkey loaf cooking. We have the soup. Ideally, it would be simmering still. Um, if you'd like, you can add at this point a little butter. We can omit it today, but uh, that butter it was set for the uh, butternut squash soup, basically just to give it a little bit of richness. Um, but again, if we're skipping dairy, not necessary at all. Mm -hmm. um, and we can just stick with the coconut milk. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, we have one more dish, or one more side dish, I should say, and that is the, uh, the spiced carrots. So again, very simple. We are just going to coat some carrots in spices and oil and call it a day. And it's that same mix of spices that we have here, so the, the pumpkin spice, the, the fall mix, that's what we're going for. Actually, I'm going to go on this one, it's a little hotter. So all of the vegetables that Zach is cooking are high in beta carotene. Yes. Ironically, we have a lot of orange. Uh, a I lot of orange that. today, and, and <laughs> I, that relates yeah, to the beta carotene. Some, we do have some tomatoes. You know, the ketchup is That's like true. is like a pea. Little red, yeah. Little red. <laughs> um, but we were are normally we're better with our colors. But I, orange is great because of the beta carotene, which turns into vitamin A. Um, and I believe it, it, it helps with a couple of different organs, not not the least uh, of which your eyes, I, right? Yeah. And then all the spices also are anti-inflammatories. Definitely. So again, carrots, oil, spices. Um, we're skipping salt today because I just generally don't cook with a lot of salt. Um, if you are going to, be aware that salt in any dish works like a magnifying glass. So a little bit goes a long way, uh, as you may have very well noticed, uh, especially prepared ingredients that you buy from the store. You're like, wow, this is really salty. Yeah. It's because they they don't consider it as, as precious an ingredient. They kind of use it a little more carelessly. So we've just cubed these carrots up. Uh, if you wanted a different kind of mouthfeel, you could also julienne them. Uh, these were small baby carrots, though, so I didn't really have much, uh, much room to work with. <laughs> and you know a baby carrot is just a big carrot cut down because you yes. can't buy a baby carrot. That's true. There is really no such thing as a baby, baby carrot. carrot. I hate to uh, ruin all the myths out there, but uh, yes, there's no such thing as a baby <laughs> carrot. They're just uh, processed and, and cut in a certain way where they're basically bite-sized. Uh, so we're just going to add, yeah, a little nutmeg, a little cinnamon, a little cardamom, a little cumin, and a little clove. Do you ever um, heat your spices first and then add things? Or do uh, you always do it this way? That's a great question. So you can toast your spices before you even use them. And when you toast them, you're going to, again, ar aromatize. You're going to bring forward new smells, new flavors that you didn't yet have. Uh, if you have whole spices that you are grinding yourself, this works even better. If you have already ground them or you bought them ground, you can still toast them off, but it's a little less effective. Um, if you have cumin and you can toast it off or fennel, anything like that, and then grind it up, amazing, amazing. flavor. The seeds amazing are awesome. flavor. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. The other is people should date their spices when they bring them home if they're dry. Great point. So a lot of people think that spices last forever. Not the case. The spices that you're buying at the store are already almost expired. Uh, they are still usable. However, the essential oils in them, especially that we're after in terms of the anti-inflammatory properties, uh, the antioxidant, they're hardly there anymore. You want to be buying as fresh as you can. Grinding them at the last minute as well, if you do buy them whole, is also ideal. You don't want to grind them and store them. You want to grind them and use them because that's when you're getting those essential oils at play, that sort of thing. And you can just use a coffee grinder. Oh, um, yeah. I would recommend buying a separate coffee grinder for yes, this because you, you can never use it for coffee again. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, definitely a great option. Uh, yeah, a coffee grinder will do the trick. Um, 
In the old days, they used a mortar, uh, mortar, mortar, and, mortar and pestle. Yep. And having had one for a few years now, I can say with confidence that I rarely use it. You use a grinder? <laughs> I use a, a coffee grinder, grinder. yep. <laughs> I, I've tried using it for the sake of purity or just being a purist, so to speak. It takes way too much time. So that goes for seeds, too. I, most of our people are not going to be doing seeds, but sometimes they can. If you want to do flax or chia, to really get the health property out of them, you have to grind them. You have to open them. They'll, if they're just a, if a seed, they'll go through your body undigested. Mm. So if you're looking for the health so property. So grinding them up, that's the key. And as you use them, you, same thing. You can't grind it all up and then use it. You have to grind it as you go. Understood, yes, um, exactly. So really it's, it's sort of um, an as-you-go mentality, not just for that, but really the way we're talking about seasonality, it's as you go. You, you face each day, you realize, what's available, what's affordable, um, and what will be good for your body. And um, you don't necessarily have to go for a product that uh, is sort of the brand name you like or that sort of thing because you can just make it yourself. Yeah, that smells so good. It okay, I have good, a question. Eh? <laughs> How hot or cold should you cook your food to keep it nutrient rich? So that's a great question. Um, in terms of how long you should cook it, everything's a little different. Um, veggies, you don't want to cook for too long. You want to basically just introduce the heat, maybe aromatize them a little bit, you know, get that flavor going, and then that's it. Any longer than that, the texture suffers and the nutrients suffer. You'll, you'll, they'll start to get mushy. And at the point they're mushy, as a rule of thumb, the nutrients are pretty much gone. I mean, I don't know if that's exactly yeah, correct. I, but. I, I, it's just for our people, you, you do have to like overcook them just a okay. bit, just because See, of the digestive, why we have you here. <laughs> just because yeah, of the digestive great. process. Um, you know, eventually, hopefully, people can go back. But there are some things that are just going to be hard. Dreams are going to be hard. The cruciferous are going to be hard. There are certain things that are hard with this um, disease and treatment and then, you know, surgery. Um, I, if, you, if there's other people out there who are watching this that don't have stomach cancer, yes, that's true. It's that the longer you cook something, the less nutrients. Also, so the minute something is harvested, it starts to lose its nutrition. That's why we want to, you know, we keep talking about buying local and using in season because it's most likely it's going to be grown near me. It's going to be harvested and it's going to be on my table the same day. I, I, I frequent my farmer's market. I go to farm stores. And two weekends ago, I was at a farm store and she's, I said, when was the corn pick? She goes, a uh, half hour ago. <laughs> I'm like, woo, no, yay. No, that's fresh. Um, couple falls ago, I, I grew up in a family that loved to pick things. My grandparents came from North Carolina, so we would go berry picking, we would go apple picking, we would go citrus picking. Um, I went out to an orchard near my house um, and Ooh, uh, got um, apples that were picked that morning. But it was Halloween and I came home and I had this big box of these apples and my husband goes, is that what we're giving out for Halloween? I'm like, I would, but I don't think the kids would like it too, <laughs> too much. But again, if it, the closest the source, the better the nutrition. But in the beginning of this journey with the um, problems with digestion, you really have to go with kind of things that are a little bit overcooked. It, it, it's always a balancing act. You know, we want to be responsible citizens of the world. We want to be good to our families, good to our communities. But you also have to be good to yourself. And so if your product comes from a little further afield, if you have to substitute something that maybe isn't local, wasn't grown yesterday, that's OK. okay. Um, the, the key is what's best for you. Um, especially when you're dealing with anything other than just life itself, which is already pretty hard sometimes. Did you do a Z on purpose? I did do a Z on purpose. <laughs> I was hoping you'd notice. <laughs> a, a, a little scratchy, but yeah, yeah. I went for a Z for, Z, for Chef Zach. Chef Zach. So we've got our butternut squash soup uh, ready to, to serve. And I added a little garnish of sour cream, but again, if we're skipping dairy, that's no issue at all. All right, and we'll go ahead and get to our turkey loaf. Let me grab, oh yeah, there we go. I'm gonna bring, again, through TV Magic, we already have a loaf ready. You can see that uh, cranberry sauce really gives a nice crust. It's, uh, looks very good. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm just certain awesome. my mouth is watering right That's now. Awesome. Now, uh, this was in the oven beforehand, so you'll notice it has a little bit of a, a sort of a, a char to it. Um, not ideal to eat, I'll be perfectly frank. Uh, you want to always avoid char. Caramelization is great, uh, but once you hit that char level, you're risking carcinogens in, in, in your diet, and that's not helpful. So we will go ahead and take a nice slab off of here. 
Are you an end guy or a middle guy? <laughs> That's a, <laughs> I'm an end guy. Are Funny you, you should ask. I was going to go for a middle piece and, uh, and just for the, That's for the, the look of it. That's the big question in our house. Are you an end guy but or a middle that's, guy? But me personally, I'll take the end any day. Okay, I have a question. Absolutely. I've heard that apricot seeds are great to eat. What are your thoughts and how would you prepare or incorporate them into a recipe? You know, I've never worked with apricot seeds before. So I, you should not eat them. Okay, see, the, I, uh, I wouldn't um, even know where to begin, to be so honest. So way back in the day, I want to say it was the 70s, um, there was experimental kind of cancer treatment with ground apricot seeds mm -hmm. um, as a cancer cure. And yeah. it made people very sick. And it's, oh, that's unfortunate. it's so not. It was basically um, like snake oil. It was medicine. in Mexico. Yeah, oh, I, that's so I unfortunate. Don't, yeah, I don't recommend it. It's, they're not edible. All right, well, that answers that. I, yeah, I've never even, never even heard of that. Of, of, the, of using those. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, a lot of people out there will tell you that they have the solution to your problems, but if they tell you that, then they're probably wrong. Uh, yeah. There is no one solution. And that's what the culinary world has really taught me is that everyone is different. Everyone has their own unique, not just tastes or, or, or preferences, but even just, you know, personal consumption habits or, or just health, you know, issues. There is no one solution. There's never one solution. Um, Although in this case, I guess there is one solution, which is don't eat those seeds. I don't eat them. So <laughs> if, um, if you're looking for other reputable sources, um, Sloan Kettering has a wonderful herbal library that's oh, okay. accessible to anybody. So if you go to the Sloan Kettering site and you put in herbs, you can search any um, herbal property, um, you know, alternative therapies. And the great thing about it is they give you the science behind it. So it tells you every oh, single great. study that's ever been done. And see, I think that at least for me, would help me feel more confident about yeah. my cooking choices. And they're not making judgment. They're not selling you anything. They're right. not making judgment about it. They're just telling you, this is the facts. And then you can discuss it with your healthcare team if this is something that, that yeah. you could do or not. Right. Any option you would, of course, at the end of the day, want to discuss with your team. Yep. Even if, uh, but, but experimenting on your own a, a little bit at a time definitely helps you feel more confident, too, in your choices. So you can work with your healthcare provider, of course, but within the subset of things they've told you, you can play around a little bit, right? If they've given you these ingredients, maybe you can combine them in a new way, that sort of thing. So we're rounding out the bend on our entree here. Very simple. Uh, you could, if you wanted to, make a, a mushroom gravy or uh, even, a, even a turkey stock-based gravy for this, if you wanted to. Uh, it is actually very moist, though, the, the loaf itself. Uh, we've made sure of that in terms of our ratio, the egg in there. Uh, the recipe calls for two eggs, I believe. I actually just stick with one. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, it, it, it's a lot firmer. Okay. Uh, I find that it's a little looser in, in that case. Okay. Yeah, with two. Okay. Um, but, but again, always err on the side. Here, I'll set this right here. Always err on the side of uh, less. Less less is more. And then that way okay. you can always work towards more. But we have the, the entree here, so we uh, can start to enjoy our meal. We have one last item, of course. And I've pre-made this for us today because essentially we're just layering for our dessert. So we have here a delicious pumpkin pie parfait. I've put it in a cute little mason jar. I love that jar. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Um, so it is simply layers of Cool Whip. We can use uh, sugar-free Cool Whip, uh, graham cracker crust right from the box. Uh, you could also, if you have graham crackers laying around, pulverize oh, yep. them in a coffee grinder, yep. no less, or yep. a blender. Yep. Uh, and again, just three layers, up and up. Uh, if you'd like to garnish with uh, the, the pumpkin spice blend that we've been using today, great option. It literally is built for it. As far as the pumpkin mix in there, like we were talking about before, I just used pumpkin puree. I added a little bit of uh, sweetened condensed milk, uh, but not necessary at all. In fact, you could just sweeten it a little bit with agave nectar or just leave it as is. The pumpkin puree is naturally a little sweet. Uh, if you, uh, again, wanted to add those pumpkin spices inside and mix that, uh, incorporate that together, Totally a great option too. Uh, you're gonna put it in either the fridge or the freezer to set. It will be a little different than when you enjoy it warm, but the flavors are all there. Um, a little more advanced technique would be to take this mason jar and put it in what's called a sous vide cooker, uh, which is a water bath, and you could cook it up to a pumpkin pie consistency and texture, but inside the glass. But that's uh, it's a little, oh, it's a little wow. more advanced. I, I, I wouldn't wanna put that pressure on anyone. Um, so, so for another day. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, here we are. We have our uh, dishes for the day. So we have, of course, our butternut squash soup, our entree, which is the turkey uh, loaf, the parsnip mash, and the spiced carrots, and our pumpkin pie parfait. Uh, so we have our fall menu here for you. I really uh, hope that everyone enjoyed, and I uh, hope we answered some good questions. 
Uh, I'm just really happy, as always, to bring you these dishes. Um, I hope you enjoy uh, your fall with these recipes or without. Uh, stay healthy. Of course, again, we want to thank our sponsors, the Debbie's Dream Foundation, Gordon Ramsay Steak here at the Horseshoe Casino for hosting us. Um, until our next show, uh, we wish you well. Do we have any other questions? I just I wanted to make good. sure. I think we're good. Yeah, we'll be back in December, right. I yes. guess. Yes. Uh, no, or November. Me, November, November, yes. We'll be back in November with our winter menu. Until then, everyone stay safe and have a good weekend.